Good morning, everyone. My name is David Gavis. I'm a reporter at the New York Times, and I'm part of the climate team there. Uh, several years ago in 2017, which is a year we'll come back to in just a moment, the New York Times decided we were going to found a climate team with the express intent of marshalling the New York Times resources across the globe to really focus on how it is industry, countries, we're going to actually make this march toward net zero and a more circular economy. I joined the team last year with a specific focus on the intersection of the private sector and public policy, looking for those multi-stakeholder solutions, public-private partnerships that were going to help get us there. And so today, it's very exciting to be talking about an effort that began here at the WEF six years ago in 2017 uh, as well that is delivering real results. Uh, and so we're here to talk about the launch of the Global Battery Passport and the GBA Alliance. And to do that, we have a, a terrific panel and some of the people involved in it. We've got uh, Dr. Martin Brudenmiller, the chairman of BASF, Benedict Sobotka, the CEO of Eurasian Resources Group, and Dame Ellen MacArthur of the MacArthur Foundation, a champion of the circular economy. We'll have closing remarks from Inga Peterson, who's the executive director of the Global Battery Alliance. Thank you all for being here. So as discussed, the, this idea was really founded right here six years ago now. And since then, there's been real traction. The idea was to create a format, a way to actually track what's inside batteries, their life cycle, where those minerals and other components came from, and what would be done with them when their life cycle at the end of that initial product was done. It, it was a great idea, but the question was, was it actually going to come to fruition? And today, we're very excited. I know Inga and some of her partners are extremely excited to say that it is finally today launching the first proof of concept with the world's first battery passport. On the way in, there are QR codes, and I think you can scan and actually have access to that first passport. But that alone, of course, isn't going to be enough. We need regulations to make this a reality and make this ubiquitous. And it was in December that the European Council and the European Parliament provisionally agreed on regulations that will make these mandatory starting in 2026. So this is going to be something that all manufacturers of large-scale EV batteries and up are going to be expected to be having associated with their products in the near future. And this could go global. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which was just passed, of course, uh, finally committing $370 billion of federal funds in the United States to the fight against climate change, also includes guidance that will make it very likely that the United States will have to adopt something like a global battery passport as well. So this is real, and we are here on its birthday to really see it into the world. So first, I would love to turn to you, Martin. You've been involved in this effort uh, from the absolute get-go. And I wonder if you could just talk about the need for it, especially from a corporate perspective. As we were talking earlier, I made the remark that these are sometimes well-intentioned ideas that come from uh, you know, activists. But your involvement and your sustained commitment to it suggests that there's a real market for it and a need for it from the commercial perspective as well. Well, I mean, I think uh, it's very clear that batteries are key for the energy transition. So there will not be any energy transition without batteries. In the same moment, we all know that this is a quite resource, energy, and, and uh, material intensive um, play, which also inevitably involves also social and environmental impact. And uh, that certainly includes um, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming with the materials um, working process. But it is also um, the issues of child labor and also human rights violations that come with these materials, where these materials actually uh, are. We have to, to tackle that um, as an industry, as um, I, I think as society, because there will be a massive growth in this industry if we want to achieve the um, e-mobility targets. So we have just recently with McKinsey looked at uh, a little bit of the data and it looks like it is quite um, real that we might have uh, growth rates of up to 30% until 2030 in this business and uh, involving all the whole value chain, we're talking about more than 400 billion um, of value and uh, a market size of 4.7 terawatt hours of battery capacity. So there will be a lot of players involved and it's very evident if we want to 
design this value chain uh, that uh, battery supply, sustainable battery supply, but also life uh, end of life strategies play a key role. And I think it is in the absolute interest of everyone to really tackle this and make this uh, transparent. And if you think about if that is done well, what we could save actually alone in the electric mobility, more than 70 gigatons of CO2 until 2050. And we could also, if we do the recycling well, most probably save up to 90% of the CO2 that is involved in the, in the virgin material. So, that is why we actually took that up, why I think it's also, it, you said it, it was incubated in 2017 to have this idea and it was a small group that started and now we ended up with 130 members in the Global Battery Alliance and they actually comprise not only foundations and government agencies but also companies from automotive, from mining, from chemicals and from cell manufacturers, even energy companies. So and I think this is very clear that, that we have to tackle this and this is why I'm very happy that we came along to um, design and have agreed on 10 guiding principles that bring transparency um, and also um, show actually how we can tackle the different uh, important uh, topics. And this is also why my company as a, as a player in this field is, is strongly interested in, in uh, running a, sub, uh, a sustainable um, uh, value chain. And I think at the very end, it goes down to the end consumer who wants to have transparency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, indeed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's drill down into the details. Benedict, can you talk a bit more about how this actually works. You've been involved in the development. What are the actual details of this? Uh, how is it going to look from the uh, OEM side? How are consumers and people who are curious about what's actually in what they're buying going to use this? The, the battery passport is, is a perfect example of the magic that can happen at the World Economic Forum because what started around a little coffee table just looking upon Lake Geneva in 2017 turned out to be bringing us to the world's largest organization in the energy storage space. Mm. So it tells you, and I encourage everyone at the forum, is to think about the coffee table as the incubator for potentially great ideas that can have a big impact. Mm. And I like the Battery Passport, which is the flagship initiative of, uh, of the Global Battery Lines, among a few other projects that we work on, is because it is very tangible. It delivers impact. It's not just a conversation. It's actually something that consumers will be able to use to differentiate what went into the battery, into the electric vehicle that they will be purchasing. So it gives consumers choice. They can choose a battery that has a lower or a higher CO2 footprint. They can choose a battery that contains minerals that have been mined sustainably or not. And it's that kind of pressure that is going to really have an impact because once you give people a choice, they will make choices mm. and they will push in addition to what we do as the, as the industry, we push for certain standards. They will pull for those standards to be adopted very quickly. So the battery um, passport is essentially a digital twin of the physical battery that's in the car, right? Sounds pretty simple. It's not because you've got dozens of minerals in that, in that product with very, very diverse sources of origin. Um, so what we've tried to do is really um, to work towards something that gives um, a, a very tangible overview of um, the current batteries. We've got three pilots, uh, one from Tesla, two from Audi. You, funny enough, you, when you go around in the, in, um, down in Davos here, some of the cars already have that sticker on it. So you mm. can, people can actually go now and scan the sticker. And I have a little sticker here to show you how it looks like. My ambition is that 10 years from now, every single electric vehicle has a sticker like that on the back. Right? And you can go and scan it. Ah, let me see where that cobalt comes from. Where was it refined again? Mm interesting, right? Because it triggers the right discussions. And particularly if we do not have information on the provenance and the ESG compliance of those products, that raises the right questions and it puts pressure on the supply chain to be more sustainable. So in, in the battery passport, as you click on it, you can open it and, and uh, open the website. Uh, it's publicly available. It gives you uh, the technical specification, capacity, manufacturing, history, material provenance, um, what are the materials flow? How do they move? Do they go through China? Do they not go to China? Go through different refiners? Who is actually the manufacturer of the cell, of the precursor, and so on? Um, and it compares that against what we've um, in included is a greenhouse gas um, emissions rule book, which has been put together by a broad coalition of multi-stakeholders, which is very important. This is a multi-stakeholder initiative. This is not an industry initiative, which is very important for the acceptance of the standards that we have in this in this uh, in this system. The battery passable will bring very new levels of transparency in the supply chain. Um, 
from beginning to end. You mentioned uh, circularity, recyclability, that's going to be an important element of that because we will have to recycle 10, 11, 12 million tons of battery materials in, in the very near future. So the ultimate goal is really provide end user, end user transparency, it's a quality seal. Um, and again, this, these are the kind of things that can happen around a coffee table in Davos. Amazing. And, and to the point about how it actually works, I mean, it sounds like we can actually all go see how it works when we walk out of the Congress Center right now. Just briefly, Ben, you mentioned these partnerships and developing the proof of concept with Tesla and Audi. What did that work actually look like? Can you just take us through some of that development process? Perhaps one of some of the challenges for the Global Battery Alliance, and also, I suspect, real challenges for the manufacturers as well, as they had to navigate some of these new data requirements, maybe dig down into their supply chains in ways that they hadn't before? The, the, the most important challenge is that the, the energy storage supply chain is highly complex and it's highly globalized. I mean, a, a, a unit of a battery material may be produced in Africa, then would be shipped from refining to China, from refining to Korea, from Korea to Japan, from Japan to the US. So you would have a, a, a unit of that battery will be going around the world two or three times before it actually ends up in the vehicle. So it's very complicated, and you have a multitude of different products that go in. And of course, you have to be very clear on what kind of standards do you want to measure. Mm. Right? You cannot measure everything in the beginning. That's what we have piloted. That's why we focused on the most immediate ones, which is uh, CSR, particularly human rights. Uh, which is a concern in some of the supply chains, um, and greenhouse gas emissions because some products in a battery or some batteries have a significantly lower CO2 footprint mm -hmm. than others. So um, th the complexity and the globality of that is, has been one of the big challenges. And then, of course, agreeing on the rules um, because we don't want to water down the rules that are being applied to the supply chain. Quite the opposite. We want to raise the standards and to make sure that we raise the bar for the industry as a whole as we build out this supply chain um, to be a sustainable supply chain. It's the, it's the, the biggest build-up of a supply chain probably since the hydrocarbon revolution at the end of the 19th century. We're, we're witnessing a, a transformation in an industry that's, been, that's, that's historic, yeah. and we have to make sure that's done in a, in a sustainable fashion. That's great. And you just mentioned things like greenhouse gases, uh, child labor. Martin, as you and the Alliance thought about uh, how to measure some of these very difficult metrics, how to standardize them across the globe, as we heard, you know, standards, operations differ vastly from region to region. How did you think about creating something that could actually translate, as it were, with a passport and, and come up with a common set of metrics, standards that would actually be useful for consumers and OEMs going forward? Yeah, and I think this was the key and that was the first obstacles we had to take as a group and actually get together because we have quite some different perspectives. Uh -huh. But that was also what the working groups, groups did. They took all this different experience to actually define a rule set and let's say a manual how you do that. Because if you, if you compare apples with peers, that doesn't help also the consumer and doesn't give the transparency. So what actually was done and uh, I think uh, Benedict just said this, there are many, many more which we have to do. So it is water usage, it is, uh, it is uh, forced labor, it's biodiversity, which in the long run you have to, to do. But we said, what are the two crucial ones from our perspective? And this is really, on one hand, greenhouse gases, and the other part is the, the child labor um, um, issue. So we have actually, in working teams, um, been sitting together and have made, I think, the first real setup that is uh, usable in both categories. Um, that's more than 100 indicators, actually, on the child labor part, where you can assess how much you go back down to the root cause of that and actually how you can access, assess your own performance in that respect. If you go to the greenhouse gas, um, also here we have, I think, uh, developed a very comprehensive framework to calculate. It is a set of about 80 rules, a methodology, how you actually tackle this and how you make this in a very comparable way, a kind of a manual. And I think it is a methodology that was broadly accepted by the players in the value chain, which is important. And as you mentioned, it looks like that this is now um, making its road in the European part, but I think the signs are also good that in the Canadian and in the American environment, they will be adopted and at the very end, it has to be a global set. And I think uh, this is where we are proud because I think the first one that comes sets a little bit the standard. That might move a bit, then uh, some other parts coming in, but I think we have actually made the first step here. And I'm, I'm very confident that the rule set, as we have defined them, makes its world to become really a global standard. 
And Martin, I'm always curious as a reporter when I hear uh, corporations effectively welcoming more regulation, as it were, effectively asking to be forced to be more transparent. Whenever I see that, it suggests to me that there is real economic value at the end of, of a process like this. Can you talk about the way in which, uh, for big companies, for big corporates, this could actually reduce costs at the end of the day, if, if you believe that's the case? Well, we don't embrace all kind of regulation, <laughs> but there's good and bad ones. And I think in something like this, the value chain, you need that because you want also to, to optimize the value of your product. And that ultimately will be only uh, maximized if actually you, you adhere to the standards and you have transparency to the consumers. As uh, Benedict said, people will make choices later, but they have to sure if they pay a higher price, that is also everything fine along the value chain. So it is in the purest interest also of the commercial player. And I think this is also one of the reasons why we moved forward. It is not an altruistic and uh, idealistic approach only. It is also desperately needed to actually um, orchestrate that chain in terms of, of, com of being commercial and competitive. Mm. It is very much about competitiveness because certainly the, the battery prices have to go down if you want to penetrate electric cars. So there is this piece on one hand going down, but you want to optimize your value. So that is one piece of regulation which we embrace. Thank you very much. Uh, Ellen, let's turn to you. Uh, you've been a champion of the circular economy, which uh, I think uh, several years ago might have still been sort of a, a somewhat foreign term to many people. I feel like it's broken through into the mainstream. And, and here today, we're talking about uh, you know, a real manifestation of, of regulation, of public-private pri partnership that is starting to bring you know, the vision of the circular economy into reality. Can you talk about how you see something like the battery passport fitting in to this work that you've been sort of beating the drum on for so long and where you think it goes from here? I think you need to take a step back and look at the whole economy mm -hmm. because I think the battery passport is a great shining light as to what's possible and what the future looks like. But when we look at the whole economy and you know we've been talking about you know the future and what's needed, um, the economy has been predominantly linear. You know, manufacturers have been buying raw materials, making things, and then selling them. And once that product is sold, that material is lost. They have no means of recovering it, and in many cases, nor has the economy, because we don't know what sits within that product. They do. And when we look at the circular economy's three principles, we have eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials for as long as possible, and then regenerate systems and nature. In order to eliminate waste and pollution, you need to not create it in the first place. And that's a design question. And that design question is crucial when it comes to the battery passport because this whole idea is about illustrating what sits within the product. So when you illustrate what sits within the product through a passport, you know where your materials are within the world. Therefore, they have much less chance of becoming waste. Because once you've sold it and you've lost it, anyone could end up with that product. But this is about keeping the value of that battery because we understand what sits within it and we're then able to recover the materials and feed them back into the economy. And then that step sets foot into the resilience space. You know, why do businesses want this, this, this change? Well, actually, they need the raw materials of the future to feed into their manufacturing processes. So you're building a circular system through the passport to enable the tracking of the materials through digital enablement to flow back into the system, which is vital for business. Business needs new raw materials in the future. And the other point that was touched on, and Martin, you mentioned it was the 90% CO2 savings mm. through the way that we manufacture batteries. That's massive. You know, when we look at the, 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 the need to shift towards a, 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 a more climate-friendly economy, mm. we always talk about the energy needs. We always talk about where does the energy come from, which is vital, which is why we have the electric cars, because we know that combustion engines and not the, the long-term future. But when we look at the split as to the, the carbon savings of that transition, 55% comes from the shift to renewables, cleaner energies. But 45% of the targets needed for that 1.5 degrees, that's how we make and use things. That's how we make and use batteries. That's how we, we collect materials and feed them into the economy. And that is huge. And that's everything. It's not just batteries. And I think this is a great example of using digital enablement to track materials within the economy. And this will be for everything in the future. This won't just be batteries, it'll be IT equipment, it'll be, it'll be plastics, it'll be infrastructure. 
We need to know where those materials are to feed them back into the economy, not only from a resilience perspective, but also from an economic perspective, mm. because you know where your stocks and flows are, and today we quite simply don't. Mm. Well, an endorsement from Dame Ellen MacArthur means a lot uh, for anyone doing work in the circular economy uh, or in the corporate world in general. Let's turn to Inga Peterson, who's the executive director of the Global Battery Alliance, who has really championed this work, especially over the last nine months. Uh, Inga, could you talk to us about what some of the challenges have been, some of the learnings, and also what comes next? Because it, this is an a, a important day, but it's really just the very beginning. Exactly. Thank you so much, David, and, and also the panelists. I, I would just like to start by acknowledging that the organizations involved in launching the world's first battery passport are true pioneers, mm. because they're the first to ask some sometimes difficult questions about their own performance. So I would just like to officially congratulate all of our members. And it is also important to recognize that this achievement wouldn't have been possible were it not for the countless hours of in-kind expert time that we've benefited from. Establishing this proof of concept is a major milestone, but it is only the beginning. But we have, at the same time, already taken away some invaluable lessons from this. So just one thing to, to consider is that a typical value chain for a, a typical OEM um, for the automotives may have upwards of 40,000 suppliers. So for us to establish end-to-end -end value chain from cradle to gate, mine to OEM, um, has been a real challenge. And we were only able to overcome it due to the trust built amongst the members in the Alliance who were all united behind that vision. And interestingly, as a result of our pilots, despite the early stage, one of our participating OEMs, um, for the first time, learned about the exact mines um, they were sourcing their cobalt from. So this immediately triggered due diligence processes if these um, materials were actually responsibly sourced. So despite it being a proof of concept, it's already shown uh, its effect. I think what's important is uh, that by creating a harmonized performance standard and framework through the rule books that Martin and Benedict talked about, we'll really be able to make transparent supply chains the norm, um, creating the pathway to address the issues that are the most salient and with the urgency that they require. Um, another little point to make is that we've engaged um, battery manufacturers that represent over 50% of the global market. Um, so we really, that gives us confidence that these pilots can set the trend for the industry to, as, to become the new norm, really. Now, would the process of agreeing the reporting rules be more straightforward in a more homogenous group in an industry setting? Certainly. But um, our members are, are completely committed to this multi-stakeholder concept. Um, we will build on that and continue building out more comprehensive indicator frameworks, including streamlined indicators on circularity, for example. Um, but critically, we also need to work on enabling interoperability with existing standards, systems, and frameworks, and addressing mission-critical issues of data governance, disclosure, commercially sensitive information, uh, and data verification. So striking this balance between comprehensiveness, level of ambition, uh, but also a company's ability to implement what we're designing is really uh, the work that we're focusing on. And in this way, we'll work uh, towards guiding consumer purchasing decisions based on product sustainability performance. So I'll just close by also thanking the World Economic Forum for writing the beginning of the GBA story for which today we've completed the next chapter. Thank you right. so much. Thank you, Inga. Do we have any questions from the audience? We've got a few minutes. Yes, sir, please, in the front. Because material may be taken out and then again put it back. So how do you do that? So that's a question maybe um, uh, Benedict, Martin, or Inga could take, which is at the point of recycling, which is, of course, you know, where I don't know that any of the batteries uh, clearly that have gotten the passport yet have been recycled yet. So some of this may be somewhat theoretical. W what actually happens? Uh, how do you track it? Uh, and and, and w what happens to that initial battery passport? And do, or is that next battery passport? presumably uh, on a battery that perhaps was actually made with recycled components, going to identify all, all that history of those materials? The battery passport assigns a unique identifiable number to each battery that's in a car. So that's a big step forward. Actually, you will actually know what kind of a battery is it, what's the chemistry, and where is it, right? How long has it been used? and where is it going to end up? So it's less of a problem today because there are very few batteries that are being recycled. Um, recycling today happens predominantly 
in the actual manufacturing process because it's today a very wasteful process. A lot of materials are actually lost in the production of batteries. So I think it's a, it's a problem we'll have to solve a little later on. Um, but this unique identifier will actually allow to find the battery and then uh, recycle the batteries for its most valuable components. One of the challenges today is, is you actually cannot recycle a significant part of the battery, right? Um, because of the chemical composition, because of the materials that don't lend itself to, to recycling, but some you can. Um, and I think it's, a, it's a, over time we will be finding ways to recycle some of the other materials in the batteries as well. Lithium, for example, is very difficult to recycle today, whereas uh, cobalt or mm. aluminium is not. So it's, um, over time we'll find a mechanism to do that, but uh, we have a few more years to work on this until these big volumes of, of used electric vehicle batteries will hit the market. And I think your question was also the entry point for a new battery has to have the batches of the information where it comes from. Right. So it has to have the end point of becoming a black mass powder, which is actually engaged in the production again. So that uh, in that respect, you can track things for a long term. Mm. And at the very end, uh, the nickels and the cobalt uh, will fuel many generations' cars. The cars might look different, but it's always the same metal doing the job. Mm. That yeah. must be the ultimate. Battery material or the battery with the lowest CO2 footprint will be a recycled battery. Yeah, extraordinary. Any other questions from the audience? Can I ask one more? Please ask one more. So now, as you said, there will be unique code. Mm. And you know that battery, particularly each manufacturer, also tracks his battery, their life cycle time. Will there be any time conflict between tracking the unique code or there will be no tracking of unique code? Is there any global agency will be tracking where this battery is going? Because then there might be conflict that... The company which is using it also tracking its own battery and the unique code, which is a global code, also being tracked. Well, I would say if it if you have to have a consistent system where the information is correct, it can go in all channels, mm -hmm. but you can always trace it back. And this is, I think, why it is important that we have one global system and not running four or five system, because otherwise there will be information lost. Then the material will disappear, and you don't know where it came from. So. Uh, that is why I think the, the global standardization is very important. Uh, and then certainly uh, uh, materials travel. You might have a car assembled in one region. It goes to another region, and the end of life is another region. So if we clo don't close that loop, I think we, we lose the information. So and, that must be the goal. And may I just ask a, a follow-up of Inga? Can you describe just very briefly w where the actual data is being held and how that's being organized and, and how transparent that's going to be? Is it going to be open source? Is it going to be on the blockchain? Where is all this data? Because it's huge volumes that we can see is on the way. Where is it going to be held, stored, and uh, and how is it going to be accessed? Thank you. Uh, easy question. <laughs> no. um, these rules are in fact still being written. So one of the principles that we try to implement for the proof of concept is to really enable interoperability of different mm -hmm. IT solutions because we believe that the market will select their own instruments mm -hmm. and there will be much competition um, with different systems, different IT solutions. So the GBA doesn't see itself very much in prescribing this, but we would like to <coughs> excuse me, um, really orchestrate this ecosystem that the different solutions can A, talk to each other, um, issue comparable information and uh, consistently report against the same rules so that we can benchmark it. Okay. Yeah, more work ahead, clearly. Uh, still to be done. We have one more question in the back. Thank you. Could you just talk a little bit more about the pilot with um, the pilots with Tesla and Audi, just what that entails? Yeah. Well, I passed that question to, to Inga. She's been intricately involved in, in those pilots. Um, but clearly, uh, Tesla and Volkswagen Group, I think they're by far the largest electric vehicle manufacturers, so to have them in the pilots, I think, is a testimony of, of the relevance of the GBA and as, as the industry is galvanizing around these standards. Um, so please, Inga. Yeah, we basically had these companies involved alongside non-governmental members, international organizations, governments, to first uh, define the rules against which they need to be assessed. Um, in terms of the pilot participation, this was open to all of our members. Um, it was opt-in, um, who wanted to be the first mm. to disclose data that hasn't yet been asked for, so it's, it's a brave step, uh, which is why it's also important to note that the data in the battery passport is realistic data. It doesn't serve yet for comparison. We've selectively uh, withheld parameters so that it cannot be prematurely compared, but we show um, the principles. Um, and we've worked with these companies to mobilize their value chain, uh, composed of GBA members, so that we can create that trusted interplay 
um, between the different uh, actors to, to start sharing information uh, without getting locked down in um, 10 years of NDA <laughs> negotiations um, and really yeah, create that trust in the system and, and that's how um, we mobilized um, the cell makers um, because the GBA combines really the entire value chain and is, is quite unique in that respect. Are the passports showing up yet? In the yes, so if you leave the room, there is a barcode displayed at the door. You can scan it with your mobile phone and access the data. Well, clearly we have more questions and answers than we have time for today. We are unfortunately out of time. Uh, congratulations on the launch of the Battery Passport into the Global Battery Alliance and all its partners. Uh, thank you very much for Ellen MacArthur for sharing with us uh, her view that this is really the fruition, uh, the, the, the manifestation of the circular economy, uh, one step at a time. Uh, and thank you to all those in the room and our panelists. Thank you very much.